Uh, before we get started, please, everybody, pull out your, your phones, iPhones, antiquated Blackberries like mine, whatever you use. Uh, please pull them out and everybody check to make sure that, uh, that they're turned off. The, uh, uh, the YouTube uh, presentation that we now do for all these events means that we really like to have the clearest uh, sound quality that we can, please. With that, let me uh, just briefly introduce our guest and our topic. As I think everybody here knows, tomorrow is the 25th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown. One of the saddest events and one of the turning points of modern history, one of the biggest news stories of the past quarter century. We were just uh, discussing up here what could match it. The Gulf War in 1991 with its impact on what has happened in the Mideast ever since, the fall of the Berlin Wall. There are only a few possible events that have matched in historical significance in the past 25 years what happened in Tiananmen Square. It was a story that attracted tremendous level of coverage from many foreign correspondents and has become sort of the defining moment in coverage of China and that has been the subject of just the terrific documentary series that Mike Chinoy has been doing. We've already had several episodes, we're going to be showing more episodes of his series on American foreign correspondents and how they've covered China over the years. But this is one that I think everybody's been waiting for. You're lucky all to get, to, to get seats in fact tonight. Uh, this event was sold out with a waiting list. So thank you all for coming and with that let me introduce Mike Chinoy. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to show this film uh, on this date in this venue. And the F I, I joined the FCC when I first moved to Hong Kong as a journalist, beginning of 1976, and I, I feel it's really appropriate to have this as a, as a venue to, to share this film with you. Um, let me just give you a very quick uh, bit of background about the project. Assignment China is a multi-part documentary film series that we've been doing at the U.S. China Institute at the University of Southern California, chronicling the history of American correspondence in China from the 1940s to the present day. The idea is basically um, that the way the American media has covered China has had a huge impact on the way in which people in the States and people around the world have looked at China, and yet most people really don't have any idea uh, how foreign correspondents in China operated. What was it like? How did they do their jobs? What were the issues and challenges they faced? And so we've been chronicling this through a series of programs based largely on interviews with people who did that work at these different times. Um, as Keith pointed out, Tiananmen Square was really a kind of watershed moment, not only for China, but for the coverage of China and for the media more generally. It was the first time that an upheaval, a crisis on that scale in a country as big, as important, and for so many years as isolated as China, um, was broadcast live, for the most part, uh, around the world. It had never happened before, and it fundamentally changed the way in which uh, journalists cover both China and stories like that around the world. Uh, the events of that spring are quite well known, but the backstory of what it was like for the journalists who were there and the kinds of issues and challenges they faced, the kind of choices they made, how they understood or misunderstood what happened um, is much less well known. But given the enduring power of the live coverage of images like the man in front of the tank, I think there's real value in looking back and trying to give people a sense of what, for those of us, I include myself in this because I was the CNN Beijing bureau chief at the time, what it was actually like to go through this experience and how the people on the ground operated. So that's what this film is like. It's 90 minutes long, and, uh, but I don't think you'll be bored. And uh, so why don't we play it and then uh, when we're done, um, we can have a um, uh, discussion afterwards. So if you could turn all the lights off. And hopefully all this technology will work. While waiting, is anybody in Beijing in the spring of 89? If so, raise your hand. I'd like to see if there are any Tiananmen veterans here. Nope? Okay. Oh. Okay. 
All right, a couple. Right, okay, let's see if this works. The world's largest public square has now become the scene of the biggest demonstration in the history of communist China. The small American press corps in Beijing at the start of 1989 was a colorful crew. There was United Press International bureau chief Dave Schweisberg, who later became known as a member of one of Beijing's first expat rock groups, the Backdoor Band. Dave, he liked to have a drink, definitely. But if a story ever happened, I, I would watch him come in and I mean, he wouldn't have passed a breathalyzer test and he could sit down and, you know, bang out a thousand word story that was just crystal clear prose. I, I've never seen that before or since. There was old Vietnam War correspondent Dan Sutherland of the Washington Post. I was probably not the best socializer. And uh, I was known as kind of a workaholic. I mean, I did a lot of my writing at night. And I would, if necessary, I would work through the night. John Pomfret, who'd studied at Nanjing University in 1982, had just joined the AP. I was not a mature 30. I just, you know, I sort of matured late. Nicholas Kristof had just arrived for the New York Times. There was always this expectation the New York Times was going to send me to either West Africa, because I had French, or to the Arab world, because I had Arabic. So I got a call out of the blue asking if I wanted to study Chinese and go to China. Also working for the Times was Christoph's new wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn. Partly because I'm Chinese-American, for me, going back to China, or going to China to report, um, was a real adventure. I mean, it was very easy. It was very easy for us to meet lots of people, and we did. We held parties uh, all the time. There was Time Magazine's Jaime Flora Cruz, the one-time left-wing Filipino student who'd been in China nearly 20 years, and Al Pesson, who'd arrived in 1987 for The Voice of America. The VOA had a special role in China because its broadcasts brought uncensored news to Chinese audiences. The impact that the foreign broadcasters had during that time was really incredible. And keep in mind, of course, this was before the internet before cell phones, before Twitter and all that stuff. So it really shortwave radio was still in its heyday at that time if you're talking about a closed society like China. John Shayan of CBS was a network veteran with years covering the Middle East and Eastern Europe. He almost always wore black and had an Irish setter named Duffy who was often the object of attention by curious Chinese. He was just fascinating to passers-by and who would sometimes not ask what kind of dog is that, they would ask what kind of animal is that. And so then I would make up stories, uh, well, it's a, it's a lion. And there was the husband and wife team of the Wall Street Journal's Adi Ignatius and Newsweek's Dorinda Elliott. We're all neighbors and we all socialize together because you're forced into this crucible and everybody was best friends with each other. And never mind, then you could keep your eye on your competition, right? So you're not going to get scooped. By this point, I was into my second year as CNN's Beijing bureau chief, working with soundman Mitch Farkas, who'd been born and raised in Hong Kong, and camerawoman Cindy Strand, who'd spent the year before the CNN bureau opened as a student in China. Every day was not what I expected. Every day was just, you know shocking and incredible and what huh what what really that's the kind of place it was and it was strange and beautiful and complicated and as 1989 got underway things were about to get a lot more complicated in early february came the announcement that soviet president mikhail gorbachev would visit beijing in may for a summit meeting with deng xiaoping the summit would bring 30 years of antagonism between the world's two communist giants to an end. For Deng, it would be the crowning diplomatic achievement of his career. Later in February, the new American president, George Bush, who'd served as head of the U.S. diplomatic mission in Beijing in the 1970s, made his own visit. The idea was to consolidate ties with Deng, whom Bush considered an old friend. We two are good friends for a long time. Delighted to see you looking so well. 
New president uh, returning to where he'd been, liaison chief, is going to be a big deal. It's going to be a very friendly reception to a new president. We also had the challenge of you can't avoid the human rights issue. And so we debated how to do this. When Bush's predecessor, Ronald Reagan, had visited Moscow, he'd met with Soviet dissidents. For China, Lord's solution was to invite the dissident scientist Fang Li Zhe to the banquet Bush would host for hundreds of Chinese dignitaries before he left Beijing. The State Department and the White House approved the list. We figured it, uh, Bush had to do something. Uh, but this would not be controversial. We had no intention of putting him at the head table or press conferences. And so we invited him as an astrophysicist, one of several hundred. The overwhelming, of course, were the Chinese leaders and all the political people. But Fong was no ordinary dissident. He had become China's most vocal advocate of democracy and Deng Xiaoping's most outspoken critic. Fong Lijer, you know, was a scientist and he had this kind of intellectual clarity and, and, and no patience for sort of dogma or, you know, party uh, rhetoric, he, and he wouldn't be intimidated in his calls for uh, greater freedom. So at the beginning of 1989, you know, he wrote this letter, open letter to Deng Xiaoping uh, calling for the release of political prisoners, and at the same time he had become the inspiration for what became known as democracy salons that were springing up on college campuses. I remember going to a couple of these salons where, you know, basically there were hardly any other foreigners there in the room. And uh, it was a bunch of, it might have been, you know, a hundred people in the room and these intellectuals in the front and they would be talking about talking about, you know, political change and, and economic reform. The journalists disagreed over their significance. These little democracy salons and I would I'd say, what is this? This is really uh, Mickey Mouse. But conservatives in the Chinese leadership were well aware of what was brewing. Just before the president arrives, the Chinese start complaining about this. And then they say they're not, their leaders wouldn't attend a banquet if Fang Lejeur was there. Finally, in an effort to obviously to save face, the Chinese agreed they would attend a banquet as long as Fang was not at the head table uh, and he didn't have a press conference. But the authorities went back on their word. En route to the Great Wall Sheraton Hotel, Chinese police stopped Fong's car and prevented him from reaching the banquet. It was the ugliest moment in nearly two decades of American presidential visits. At the Sheraton Hotel, the AP's John Pomfret got the first word and tried to call his bureau chief, Jim Abrams. We didn't have cell phones then. Uh, we, had, we actually had them for the crackdown, but we didn't have them then. So I'm trying to call Jim, Jim's not, and I'm screaming at him, and he's, he's put me on hold, and I'm yelling through the phone in order to try that he would hear me, to get him to hear me, because you know it's on his desk. And he finally picked it up, and he said, oh, you have a story, okay, and then we filed a bulletin, and it went on from there. So then we tried to track down Fong the rest of the evening, and you know that became a whole sort of sub-event, and eventually we found him and he had an impromptu press conference. And it means that the government don't like my opinion about the how to, uh, we, we ask a more democracy. The Chinese officials them stated goals that Fong was not going to be at that dinner, and they succeeded. They did not succeed in, in keeping this out of the, the world spotlight, though, because suddenly it became this big issue. American presidents don't hesitate to spotlight human rights abuses in the Soviet Union. After tonight's incident, George Bush may wish he'd spent more time criticizing leaders here than courting them. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, with the president in Beijing. James Baker was Bush's secretary of state. The president wasn't happy about it because it was the first uh, trip and this uh, and that, uh, and that incident sort of uh, overshadowed, at least uh, in, in, as far as the press were concerned, uh, the, the trip and what President Bush was trying to, uh, trying to prove with the trip. So he was not the least bit happy about it. In fact, Bush and his key advisors were furious. There was a big uh, kerfluffle internally about how uh, Fang Lejeur got on the guest list. But instead of blaming the Chinese, Bush's national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, hoping to smooth relations with Beijing, held a background briefing for reporters from the New York Times and Washington Post, and, identified only as a senior administration official, blamed Winston Lord. Scowcroft, national security advisor, gives a background, which basically says, and got worldwide media attention, 
this gets to the press aspect, that the, pre I mean, I'm, I'm overstating a little bit, but basically said the president's trip was screwed up because the embassy invited this guy, didn't check it with us, and now we've had a disaster. I mean, to have your own White House blame you instead of the Chinese was one of the more frustrating episodes in my life. In less than two months, Lord would be gone as U.S. ambassador, to be replaced by James Lilly, a longtime CIA officer who'd been the CIA station chief in Beijing when Bush was the U.S. envoy there in the 70s. But Beijing's heavy-handed treatment of Feng Li Zhe underscored the nervousness of China's leaders. We learned that there are people in the party who will say enough is enough and that we will not let this happen, even though it will be internationally embarrassing. And that was a moment that was important. The Chinese leadership had good reason to be nervous. You have the whole winter where there's the sense that something's happening. I remember Fan Li Zhu, you know, he said it right in front of me. He said, Shedo Bupashe, nobody's afraid of anyone, right? And then you know that the, 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 you know, the fuse is lit. As intellectuals increasingly debated the need for greater accountability and democratic reforms, popular discontent intensified as well. Some of it was political freedom, but a lot of it was corruption, inflation, we reported that there was unease and turbulence. All of this fueled a power struggle within the leadership. Zhao Ziyang had become Communist Party General Secretary in 1987, after party elders had purged his even more liberal predecessor, Hu Yaobang, for failing to crack down on student protests in late 1986. But Zhao, too, was a reformer. However, he had to share power uneasily with the conservative premier Li Peng. The two factions battled over the pace and scale of economic and political change, while Deng Xiaoping, the elder statesman, still held ultimate authority. On April 15th, Hu Yaobang died of a heart attack. UPI Scott Sabat, whose girlfriend, Didi Di Huang, was the secretary to Winston Lord's Chinese-American wife, Betty, got the first tip-off and told his boss, Bureau Chief Dave Schweisberg. I got a call from Didi, and that's how I knew... Dave knew that my source of, of this information was the U.S. ambassador. Nobody else knew. So I remember Seth Faison at South China Morning Post at, at the time. You know, he eventually was for the New York Times. But I'm pomfret. These guys would all question me and say, how does a, you know, a punk like you uh, scoop us? But, but Dave knew because it was just coming directly from, you know, the, the highest source in the embassy. At the beginning, it really wasn't clear how big a story this was going to be, especially uh, for television. Uh, so I remember I was sitting at home on a Saturday afternoon playing with my dog and my kid, and the phone rang, and it was an editor from the CNN foreign desk saying uh, that The Wire is probably UPI. Uh, had reported that some guy named Hu Yao Bang had died and did we need to do anything about this? And my reaction was, well, you know, he was purged a couple of years ago. He's not that uh, important a figure now. So just have the anchor read a few seconds on air. It's just not going to be that big a story. Well, boy, was I wrong. Over that weekend, wall posters went up on campuses to mourn Hu's passing. And it was already clear way before Hu Yaobang died that there were tremendous tensions between Li Peng and Zhao Ziyang. And um, I think that the students were aware of that. I think that was one reason why they ended up protesting. They took advantage of this paralysis that arose from that leadership split. On the night of Monday, April 17th, several thousand students marched to Tiananmen Square. I got a call about 2 o'clock in the morning from Dave Schweisberg. Uh, uh, he'd become one of my closest friends, and by this point we created a kind of informal alliance between UPI and CNN. We were both uh, underfunded, struggling, the sort of underdog uh, news organizations, and uh, we helped each other uh, wherever we could. And so Dave told me that he'd gotten reports that students were marching towards Tiananmen Square, uh, at which point I woke up uh, Cindy and Mitch and we grabbed the camera gear and headed off to the square. We basically intercepted this band of college students uh, uh, not too far from Peking University. And I got off the car and I followed them, I interviewed them, until they, the, the, they reached uh, Tiananmen Square and unfurled that um, now famous uh, banner, white banner, 
uh, memorializing Hu Yaobang. It was the moment when mourning turned into political protest. The praise for Hu Yaobang coupled with slogans against corruption and for faster reform. We got back to the bureau and I called CNN headquarters in Atlanta and I said, we have this amazing story, we have to book a satellite feed. And at that point, a 10-minute satellite feed a transmission cost about $2,000 and CNN hated to book unilateral feeds. They always liked to join when other networks were uh, also feeding so that the cost could be shared around. But I convinced them that this was a big enough deal so they agreed on a unilateral feed. So we crashed out this package and uh, as uh, dawn was breaking, we raced through the streets of Beijing to uh, CCTV where we did the transmission. And it was interesting when we, when we, when we uh, sent the story, uh, watching some of the technicians at Chinese TV, you could see they were excited by this. And so the story went out and it was the first piece to air on American television about the protests in Beijing in the spring of 89. But at CNN and the headquarters of other U.S. news organizations, the focus was not on Tiananmen Square. It was on the upcoming China visit of Soviet leader Gorbachev. Bernard Shaw anchored CNN's primetime newscasts. These two great powers in the communist world, and globally anyway in terms of their influence, finally deciding to meet in Beijing and settle, not once and for all, but to settle this, this decades-long dispute. Historic, very historic. And because CNN was a global network, on the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we had to be there. At CBS, which only had a 30-minute evening newscast, anchor Dan Rather was having trouble convincing his bosses. We began lobbying with the then president of CBS News, David Burke, to cover the Gorbachev trip, saying, listen, Sino-Soviet relations are still extremely important to the peace and stability of the world. And David Burke didn't, to his credit, didn't say no, but a big expensive trip and is that worth it? Alec Miran was a senior producer for CNN's special events unit. We had this audacious idea, because I had been in China earlier that year for a uh, President Bush trip, and it was very tightly controlled in terms of transmission, in terms of uh, what you could do and couldn't do. And I talked to Mike Chinoy and said, Mike, here's what we'd like to do. We'd like to bring in our own satellite dish. We made an even more audacious request, which was, we want to broadcast from the Gate of Heavenly Peace, which I guess was technically at the edge of the Forbidden City, which overlooks Tiananmen Square, which to my knowledge had never been done live. An engineer and I went and, and Mike had set up meetings uh, with the foreign ministry, and we said, um, please, we would like to transmit, and we would show live coverage of what we were planning to show was, you know, the crowds to see um, Mikhail Gorbachev. As Mirren and an engineer came to Beijing and surveyed the roof of the Beijing Hotel overlooking Tiananmen Square as a possible live shot location, to CNN's surprise, the Chinese agreed to let them bring in their dish or flyaway, but insisted it be set up at the Great Wall Sheraton Hotel. That's when we made the request for the microwave transmitter. Uh, we thought that was rather audacious. We'll bring a little microwave transmitter, which is a unit that was not very much bigger than a book, um, which would transmit our signal of Mike or Bernie Shaw, our anchor, back to our headquarters at the uh, Sheraton Hotel, five miles away. The Chinese approved the microwave as well, but the authorities were increasingly preoccupied by protests in the streets. Saturday, April 22nd, was the state funeral for Hu Yaobang. As Deng Xiaoping and other top officials gathered in the Great Hall of the People, outside, in Tiananmen Square, tens of thousands of students held their own memorial. I had a feeling that, that this might be something that had staying power. The authorities had the same concern. And on April 26th, the People's Daily carried a strongly worded editorial denouncing the protests as counter-revolutionary turmoil. I saw that and I realized this is Deng Xiaoping, this is from the top, it's in the People's Daily, it's calling uh, this a riot or chaos or luan, you know, something, some word like that, which it was not because the whole thing was uh, incredibly peaceful. The next day, the students responded by defying the authorities and marching 10 miles 
from Beijing University, Beida, all the way to Tiananmen Square. April 27th is also my birthday. It was my 30th birthday. The first students, a small number of students, came out of um, Beida and began marching, and then all these other students came in. And yeah, we, we walked the whole way uh, to Tiananmen, and it was an extraordinary sight. And you know, the fact that it was my 30th uh, birthday, wow, what a party. There was you know, sort of a phalanx of officers and then you had, you know, thousands of people behind. I, we, I was up near the front and you just had the, just pushing and pushing and pushing. And it wasn't aggressive pushing. It was just, it was a beautiful day, which always helps. But it, then just the police just gave way. So the students came through and I'm up on my ladder and I have a great shot. And suddenly I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I start going up and over and up and over and up and over. And I kept rolling. The tape's going backward and I fall down and all the feet are walking over me and the ladder's mangled. And... We got swept away and then about an hour later some very polite student came up to me with this mangled mess of a ladder and he goes, Madam, I think you lost your ladder. I have been following you now for quite some miles and I would like to return your ladder. My wife, uh, Newsweek's correspondent, Dinda Elliott, was um, eight months pregnant at that point, but so devoted to the story. So she was marching all the way from the outskirts of town with the students. There was this feeling of optimism, like for the first time you felt like nothing can go wrong. These people, including these grannies who were, you know, they would see me, for example, with my belly out and they'd, you know, throw me milk, little plastic baggies full of milk and, say, and they'd say, you know, take care, protect yourself. Two days before arriving in Beijing as the new U.S. ambassador in early May, James Lilly had dinner in Washington with Winston Lord. We were having dinner together and all of a sudden, the TV screen goes on, and there's these demonstrations in, in uh, Tiananmen Square. And so I said to Wynn, I've just got one question for you. Um, is this for real? This is not being manipulated, is it? And Winston said, yes, it is for real. This is a genuine populist movement. As Gorbachev's May 15th arrival approached, the student protest continued. The weekend before his arrival, they decided to up the pressure by starting a hunger strike in the square a move that won enormous public sympathy. By now, a number of students had emerged as key leaders, including the charismatic Wu Kaishi and the cerebral Wang Dan. We were talking about how to deal with uh, reporters, how, how can we have a good relationship. We were all young students, students at university, we don't have much experience. Me, myself, is maybe the most experienced student among them, but even, even myself, I, I don't have a lot of acknowledgement of how to deal with reporters. The reporters at this point had been going non-stop for a month. My memories are just being the most tired I have ever been or ever will be and being incredibly hungry. You would um, come back to the office and you would file and I can remember sometimes lying down on the floor in the office, just lying down on the floor in the office and sleeping for an hour or two on the floor. You know, no pillow or anything, just sleeping. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you'd go back out. Terrell Jones, a Chinese speaker based in Tokyo, joined his colleagues at the AP. On May 13th, students began a hunger strike on the square, which I remember was met with some exasperation at the bureau because it was, oh, God, it's something else we have to put in the story and got to find out what's going on and spend some time on. Jones was one of many journalists not based in Beijing who'd been given a visa by the Chinese to cover the Gorbachev visit, including scores of people for the networks. We wound up with 57 people from outside China with um, several camera crews, multiple correspondents, uh, producers, editors, everything you would want. More than a day before Gorbachev stepped off that plane for that meeting with Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. we knew that this story was mushrooming. And we also knew that with our live capability, our satellite facilities, that this was a story that was on the minds of people watching from around the world. We were set up on the, on the rostrum, the, the gate of heavenly peace, the place where uh, Chairman Mao had 
proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China. It was the place where he'd reviewed uh, millions of Red Guards in the Cultural Revolution. And now we were broadcasting live from this place, all because the Chinese had planned to hold Gorbachev's welcoming ceremony in Tiananmen Square. So we had these amazing reports showing Mike standing literally on the edge of the Forbidden City, and behind him was Tiananmen Square, and on the edge of the Tiananmen Square was the uh, Great Hall of the People. And suddenly Gorbachev was not there, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Finally there was word that they, would, they were canceling the arrival ceremony. Jim Laurie, who'd opened the ABC News Beijing bureau in the early 80s, was now based in Moscow and had returned to China for the Gorbachev visit. They couldn't use the Tiananmen, the area just outside of the Great Hall of the People. They couldn't use that for some of the official events. That was the place where they would, they would greet their, their state visitors. Uh, and of course, when they did it just at the airport, and they had to bring Gorbachev in, I believe, through a back door of the Great Hall of the People, that was, it, it struck us at the time, as quite a humiliation for the Chinese leadership. The inability of Gorbachev to meet in the Great Hall of the People blocked by the students. And of course this enraged them. Good evening. The embarrassment was compounded by the fact that it was all being broadcast live. We were broadcasting live not just for our evening news broadcast, we were taking up large hunks of airtime during the day. On Tuesday morning, uh, the day after Gorbachev's arrival, uh, we went back to resume our uh, live broadcasts uh, from the rostrum. Uh, but when we got there, we discovered that the Chinese had rescinded the permission. So suddenly now they were telling us, no more gate of heavenly peace. And we said, we have to keep a presence there. This is, this is some of the most compelling video any of us had ever seen. And I said to Mike, I said, well, it doesn't say we can't be, they said we can't be at the gate of heavenly peace. They didn't say, you can't be in, in Tiananmen Square. And Mike said, well, you're right. And Chinese authorities are very literal. So if we do this and they come and uh, bust us, we'll say, well, you, you didn't give us permission, but you didn't deny us permission either. A CNN engineer figured out uh, that a signal from a microwave link in the square could be beamed uh, down to Chinese TV headquarters, which would then beam it back across Beijing to the satellite dish at the CNN workspace at the Great Will Sheraton Hotel, which would then send it up to the satellite, where it would then be downlinked in Atlanta uh, and put on the air. It seemed crazy, but somehow it worked. And we were live from the square. I mean, for us, as a journalist, that was, it doesn't get any better. You know, you're... I mean, you're live from Tiananmen Square. I mean, these days you can be live with an iPhone from anywhere, but that was an extraordinary moment. The students are winning the support of the people. It has left the government on the defensive. In the following days, the number of protesters swelled, inspired in part by Gorbachev's efforts to change the Soviet Union. Most of those, those interviews that I had dealt with the positive feelings that they had towards Gorbachev, the reformer and sort of, we need a generation of reformers in China. We had those days where, I think it was two days in a row where the estimates were that a million people or more were in and around Tiananmen Square, and uh, those are incredible numbers, and it involved people from all sectors of society. Orville Schell, a longtime China scholar and journalist, was also in Beijing. It was epic, and you know, it's right to say again, but Tiananmen Square was like a great soundstage. I mean, any journalist who was there, they knew that whenever they wanted, they would, you know, week after week after week, they could just go down to, to Tiananmen Square and there was a, a cast of thousands ready to perform for them. It was a fabulous story, then it just went on and on and on. It was like a serial on television that never stops. There's always a question of whether American audiences have an appetite uh, for international news, um, and this proved that we did. I mean, I don't know what the ratings were, if we even had accurate ratings at that time, but, you know, the feedback from people around the United States and around the world was, give us more, you know. These are amazing pictures. These are amazing stories. It wasn't just American audiences. The Voice of America's coverage was making independent news of the protests available to Chinese audiences. It was a very big deal in China and people would transcribe our Chinese newscasts 
by hand and then copy them on mimeograph or uh, photocopy machines and post them on telephone poles around the city. Like CNN, other news organizations were now staffing the square 24 hours a day. It was a 24-hour kind of a party scene uh, early on. You know, the people with guitars, people with um, uh, putting up tents eventually, and uh, people awake at all hours. And they had a printing press, and they had medical clinics, and they had people bringing food, and um, it was like a city within Tiananmen Square. And we, I mean, we used to call it T-Square, right? When we'd call each other, hey, we need supplies at T-Square. With fewer staff and resources, UPI, which was already in financial trouble, fought to keep up with the competition. UPI at that point, you know, it's not what it's become, but, uh, you know, very beleaguered. And uh, so competing, our competition, we considered AP, Reuters, AFP to a lesser extent. And they were all, you know, much better resourced. But, you know, Dave, even the playing field. Cindy Strand spent hours on the square with Schweisberg. Oh, my God, Dave, Dave. He was funny and cynical, and he loved China, and he hated China, and he used his humor to get him over those humps of the frustrations of covering China. And um, always curious, always, you know, wants to be, wanted to be in the middle of it. Reporters worked hard to develop relationships with the student leaders. For the AP's John Pomfret, this led to a decision to take one of them, Wu Kaishi, to dinner at the height of the hunger strike and not report about it. It was one of these funny moments where, what do you do? Do you write about it? You know, where Kaisi breaks hunger strikes, goes, gets, goes and gets, you know, noodles with beef, or do you not? And um, my decision obviously was not to write about it because I felt this guy was a source. He was going to be a very, very useful source. He turned out to be a very useful source and, you know, protect him. Uh, and so I did. This was just one illustration of the degree to which many reporters openly sympathized with the students. I think to a certain extent we idealized the students uh, to the point where it was a little bit shocking when we discovered that some people who were supposed to be on hunger strike were actually having a meal at the Beijing hotel. Yet this was never reported at the time. The media were on the side of the, of the protesters. It was hard not to, I mean, to see the idealism, to see the bravery, to see the kind of raw excitement. It was, to be honest, very hard not to get wrapped up in that. The pressure of deadlines, space limitations, and audiences unfamiliar with China also led many journalists to oversimplify what the students were demanding. We often are shorthand was pro-democracy protests. We did try to regularly explain more broadly, you know, what that was shorthand for. Uh, um, and I'm not sure how good a job we did um, at that. We probably had a tendency to sound, to make it sound too much like a made in America kind of democratic mm -hmm. movement. But uh, that doesn't invalidate this as a popular movement for reform. You know, and, and maybe democracy is an easy catch-all. Maybe that confuses people with Western-style democracy or U.S.-led democracy. But, you know, it was clearly a movement that was driven by some really powerful uh, senses of, of the injustice uh, in societies. You know, there's another element in this issue of superficiality, and that is, uh, by about the middle of May, a lot of the reporters who were covering the story uh, were outsiders. They weren't based in Beijing. They'd come in for the Gorbachev trip or later they'd come in just to help out as people got totally exhausted and burned out. So these were folks who really didn't have much experience in China. They didn't really know the place, its history, their politics. And I think that contributed uh, to this sort of oversimplification of, of the narrative. And I think it may also have kind of created this false optimism, these raised expectations that this was all going to have a kind of happy ending. And when it didn't, uh, then the, the, the reaction among the audience, audiences in the States, was even stronger. We're sending back these images to the United States, and understandably people get excited about it, but the expectations of our audience in the States are going to far outrun 
any realistic expectations here. Even some seasoned China watchers were swept away by the euphoria. It was very difficult not to believe it's over. The worm has turned. This system is going to change. And I, it wasn't just us. I think most Chinese had that same sense of maybe after all, you know, we have come to the end of this, this dynasty. But not all of them. Melinda Liu, who'd opened the Newsweek Beijing bureau nearly a decade before, flew in to replace Dorinda Elliott, who'd gone to Hong Kong to have her baby. I was convinced pretty early on that there was going to be a bad ending to this. I thought it might end badly, but I didn't think it would end with weapons being fired. I remember saying, you know, in Chinese mail, how Sha Chang, like, you know, my Chinese friends would say it too, you know, no good outcome, but I don't pretend, even until the night of the massacre, I do not pretend to, you know, have believed that what took place was going to take place. For most of the media, the demonstrators had turned the Sino-Soviet summit into a side story. But the humiliation of the Gorbachev visit brought the power struggle within the leadership to a head. Hardliners led by Premier Li Peng, with the support of Deng Xiaoping, accused Zhao Ziyang of supporting the students and demanded a crackdown. The rule of uh, the foreigner reporters is uh, influenced the decision for government. One example is the Gorbachev, when he visited China, and maybe the, the report about the whole event, whole protest, make our leaders feel lost face and enraged. The face of our leadership is very, very important. They can sacrifice everything for, for save their face. And the lo losing face for them is a very serious thing. Just before dawn on Friday, May 19th, a haggard-looking Zhao Ziyang came to Tiananmen Square and addressed the students. I remember that, that utterly sad moment when Zhao Ziyang went to the square, and he goes among these young people, and he says to them, with tears in his eyes, I've come too late. His physical presence was a, a statement to these students. I lost the fight, and soon you will feel the wrath of our government. And I found myself breathing harder and harder and getting tense. My, my stomach was tensing up. Because in effect, he had the appearance of, of the Grim Reaper. Here was Mr. Bad News. It was the last time Zhao would be seen in public. Throughout the day, rumors of a coming crackdown swirled through Beijing. The challenge for CNN was to cover this story. First of all, when you're covering any story live, in effect, you're gingerly handling nitroglycerin. You don't want to overplay the story, you don't want to exaggerate it, and you strive very mightily to understand what's going on. The frustrating part about Beijing, the summit, Tiananmen Square, is that we had no government officials who could tell us what the government was thinking. At one of the demonstrations in the square, John Pomfret had become friendly with a young Chinese military officer. Late on the afternoon of May 19th, the two held a furtive meeting, where the officer read Pomfret the text of a speech given by the Beijing party boss, telling party cadres that martial law would be declared that evening. I knew, you know, four or five hours before it was declared there was going to be martial law, but my problem was that I was so tired that I dozed through most of the speech because he, was, he wasn't going to give it to us. It was still, I guess, uh, you know, classified, but it was about to be released. But so I dozed through it and we never fi filed. UPI's Dave Schweisberg, who was well plugged in, was getting the same information. So was I from a Chinese media contact. Mike came home from a long day at the uh, at Tiananmen Square and said, uh, I've, I've heard that Li Peng uh, is going to address the people tonight. And I said, what do you, what do you think, Mike? And he said, he said, it can't be good. And Bernie Shaw, who I didn't even know who had been, who had been listening, said, um, said, martial law. As darkness fell, tension mounted. They started announcing things from the loudspeakers at, at Tiananmen. And, and um, it, um, you know, nobody knew what to expect. But yeah, there was a real, uh, 
things certainly felt very ominous. Late that evening, Premier Li Peng appeared on television and announced the imposition of martial law. The army was on the outskirts of Beijing. Reporters feared the worst. When the martial law was declared, I had a sense that this thing is finished um, and they're going to crack down. I was shooting pictures and I'm watching all of this and um, maybe it's because I was tired and maybe it's because I was hungry, but um, I started to cry because it suddenly hit me what this meant. And I knew that they were going to come in and put this down. When they finally declared martial law, Dave said, you know, his Chinese wasn't very good, but he said, I want tanks. And we went out and we got the first, you know, we got the first story and the first photographic evidence. I drove all the way to Marco Polo Bridge and uh, I came around the corner and there was a line of hundreds of T-72 battle tanks and I had never seen anything like that in my life. Larry Wurzel was the U.S. Embassy's defense attache and became an important source for a few trusted reporters, including Dave Schweisberg and Scott Savitt at UPI and my team at CNN. I don't think the press, uh, for the most part, they never really learned how and where to cover the military. And it, it, if they did know where to find the military, then uh, for the most part, they didn't know what they were looking at. We worked very closely with the embassy and Larry Wartzel. I would go back to him and just bring back all the, all the, 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 you know, because I could read Chinese. So, uh, you know, I would, I would take photographs and write down all the identifying information on those armored vehicles. And that was, uh, that was gold to, to, to the embassy. And, uh, you know, they reciprocated. I remember seeing, uh, I don't know if I'm giving any national secrets away, but you know, now we obviously all see these satellite images, but at the time that was top, top secret classified. And Larry showed me what it looks like when a quarter of a million armored troops are converging on a, on a national capital. And it looked like a giant donut. And, and then he pointed and he said, this is us right at the center of this. And they're coming from all sides. But in the outskirts of the capital, troops were met by crowds of citizens who blocked their way. And to the astonishment of almost everyone, the soldiers halted their advance. I had an emotion thermometer in my head. And as the day dawned, that thermometer started rising. The scene and the emotion of reporting Civilians swarming around army trucks loaded with troops who were armed to the teeth, stopping them in their tracks and telling them, you are us. Don't go to the square. Don't beat. Don't shoot us. You are our brothers. We are your children. And then these two grim-faced Chinese officials marched into the CNN workspace in the Great Wool Sheraton Hotel. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning on that Saturday morning, um, May 20th. And they said, you have to stop your live transmissions in an hour. CNN has been told by the Chinese government here in Beijing that in, uh, oh, 42 minutes, the government will pull the plug on all satellite transmissions out of the People's Republic of China. To have a government official walk into your control room and say, Stop what you're doing. First of all, I just felt raging resentment. I couldn't show it on the air, but I, my hand literally was shaking. What they were saying to us was, um, what you're showing now has nothing to do with Gorbachev. Your license was only for Gorbachev. And my direction from our very senior people up to the president in Atlanta was, um, we have a lease, we have a business deal, uh, you have to let us stay on the air for eight hours, and if you want to shut us down, you have to write it. What followed became one of the most memorable moments in the history of television news. CNN managed to hook up a camera inside its control room, and suddenly the standoff was being shown on live TV around the world. Now I'm here announcing that CNN should stop the movable Earth station and it's uh, transmitting uh, frequencies 
right away. The government is, has ordered us to shut down our facility. We're, we are shutting down our facility. Can we, can we, can we yeah. sign off? Maybe sign yeah, let's off. see, Bernie. That's the story to the moment for all of the hardworking men and women of CNN. Goodbye from Beijing. At one point, Atlanta sent word to Beijing that President Bush was watching what was unfolding. You could say that that was the beginning of the CNN effect. Tiananmen was the first example of the power of the global uh, techno technological revolution, uh, the power of the media to drive policy. That night, when I got back to the hotel, I wept. Why was I crying? I was angry that no longer could we do our jobs. And I also thought about being a, a citizen of the United States of America. I'm a child of democracy. Freedom is all I've known. And after those days of protest, of high emotion, of pleading for recognition and respect, and knowing, not specifically, but generally knowing that eventually these aged Chinese leaders are going to crack down on these young people. But the anticipated crackdown did not come, despite almost daily rumors that troops and tanks were on the move. Instead, the square remained occupied by protesters. There were uh, people taking things into their own hands. Uh, there were uh, random, almost freelance checkpoints uh, around our town. Uh, people around the square, the people there, students there, and others tried to form their own little city and semi-government there. <laughs> I remember that uh, yeah, they were asking journalists for press passes to let them into the inner sanctum at the Heroes Monument. These Chinese students, they, they recreated a hierarchical order. And, you know, never mind, they had been through Communist Youth League, so, you know, they had been trained to do this their whole life. And I remember thinking, this is worse than trying to get into party headquarters. As the days went on, the mood did start to change, and it started to get quite trashy, and the festival feeling started to be replaced by people who were getting sick, and it wasn't just students anymore. I remember uh, going to Tiananmen Square and seeing the state, the sorry state of the square by then. It was, you know, and it was dirty. Uh, I think the organizers had started to lose control of the square itself. With exhaustion taking its toll, news organizations brought fresh staffers who got tourist visas by pretending they weren't journalists. Jeff Widener was the AP photographer in Bangkok. The first thing I did was approach the uh, Chinese consulate for a journalist visa. and. Uh, I remember distinctly they said, Mr. Widener, it would not be convenient for you to go to China right now. So I guess that was uh, the end of that, and I had to think about some other possibility to get in. So I decided to go to Hong Kong. I told the U.S. Embassy that I had lost my passport because it had previous stamps from my entry into China. I went to a small travel agency and I asked for a tourist visa, and they managed to get me one. Jonathan Scher, a cameraman with international experience based at CNN headquarters in Atlanta, got a tourist visa in the U.S. When I first got there, uh, I, um, I was put on the overnight shift, uh, just to uh, take pictures of the students sleeping, the people that were there spraying some kind of uh, antibacterial spray to keep the vermin down. and just uh, in case something happened. CNN sent Tokyo Bureau Chief John Lewis to rent a room at the Beijing Hotel with a balcony that had a clear view down to Tiananmen Square, both for a high vantage point and to be a place where exhausted staffers could take a break and recharge their equipment. By this point, Newsweek's Dorinda Elliott was in Hong Kong waiting to give birth. I go into labor on May 23rd, and, or May 22nd, suddenly, and um, I call Adi. It's the middle of the night. I call him in Beijing, and he's in his office. She called me after midnight, and I was like, okay, you know, I'm really busy. What's up? And uh, I say, Adi, you know, my water broke. I'm, I'm going to labor. And Adi says, yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, there's the rumor that there are tanks coming out of the square, Tiananmen, and, you know, yeah. And then I said, Adi, my water broke. I'm going, I'm going to labor. And he says, what? You know, holy shit. So I just drove my car to the airport, just essentially abandoned it, talked my way into, 
you know, a ticket. I get a friend over with me the next day to, you know, help me through labor. But, um, you know, the whole time it's like this race against the clock. Is Adi going to make it? We finally get to Hong Kong. Again, there are no cell phones. I cut to the front of the line at customs. I cut to the front of the taxi line. I get in a taxi. I say, you know, take me to take me to the peak, you know, to the Matilda Hospital. As I drive up, it was the top of the peak in Hong Kong Island, and the nurse comes out and says, you're probably Mr. Ignatius, aren't you? And I'm basically saying, the hell with the husband, who cares, let's just get this baby born. But literally, as they're saying, push, Adi walks in the door of the, of the delivery room. So I get there, and three minutes later, our first son, Oliver, is born. By now, the protesters at Tiananmen were running out of steam. Some news organizations continued to bring in fresh blood. CBS sent Richard Roth, a correspondent from New York. The AP brought in photographer Liu Hongxing, now based in Seoul, but who'd covered China years earlier. Others, however, began to scale back. The week before June 4th, people thought it was over. Only half of the Newsweek team was here because the other half wanted to go on R&R &R to Hong Kong. On June 1st, the mood in the square changed dramatically with the arrival of the goddess of democracy, created by students at the Central Academy of Fine Arts. It was a brilliant piece of political theater. Here you have this goddess of democracy, which resembles the Statue of Liberty, right in the middle of Tiananmen Square, uh, right behind it is, overlooking the square, is the giant portrait of Chairman Mao. And you know, it was a great shot, and the symbolism was very, very powerful. The arrival of the goddess revived the students' flagging spirits. For the hardliners in the Chinese Communist Party, it was the last straw. On the night of June 2nd, I was late duty at the office. And I remember hearing just noises outside that were unusual, sort of huffing and shuffling. and. And I looked out the window, which looked right onto Chang'an Boulevard, and I saw hundreds of, of soldiers. I made a call, and then I got in the car. What happened was they got toward the square. I was watching from the balcony of the Beijing Hotel, and I was broadcasting this live over the phone, and I saw these crowds come and simply stop the soldiers who'd been jogging towards Tiananmen Square and force them uh, to go back. Uh, if it was intended as a show of force to somehow intimidate the protesters, it totally didn't work. The next night, it would be different. The assault on Tiananmen Square is now underway. There has been gunfire, there are people dead, there are people wounded in various places around Beijing. Hopped on my bicycle and uh, hurtled toward uh, Tiananmen Square and you could hear the gunfire ahead and the crowds were rushing the other way. And I kept thinking, this is a crazy job where there's gunfire, everybody in his right mind is running that way, and you're going toward it. John Pomfret was on Chang'an Street, the Avenue of Eternal Peace, near Mushudi, several miles west of Tiananmen Square. There were buses that had blocked the small bridge coming towards the center of the city, where we were. And uh, people began to throw stones at the military, throw rocks at the military. And the military approached the buses, um, and, and, then some, and then basically they got off the trucks. And at that point, people began, they began to fire. I can hear it right in my mind, like I'm reliving it. Pa, 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 right? And those are those AK-47s on semi-automatic. I hit the dirt. I saw people either falling or being shot. It was like really bad because even if they weren't intending to kill people they were just there was just people shooting in the darkness so you know a lot of people were just getting hit by accident and you know uh the the bullets bullets are so close that you not only hear the per, the percussion of the shot but you hear the zing and that means it's really close and then the most extraordinary thing started happening an apc comes in front of Chairman Mao's portrait and it's set on fire. The protesters crawled on top of the armored personnel carrier. I was photographing. Bullets would fly past us and you'd hear people crying and screaming and this APC was on fire and I think many soldiers died in that APC that night. There's a soldier who's dead curled up on the ground. I took one photo. I couldn't take more because I had no battery power hardly. People are throwing rocks, they're going crazy, they're running around. There's one guy who's on fire. He's rolling around on the ground, and there's people trying to put him out. And I'm looking down at my camera, and I'm waiting for the flash to get the ready light on. And as soon as I see it flash, I pick the camera up to my eye to take a picture, and boom! I just like, 
whoa, and, I, and, I, and my head jerks back, and I look down, there's blood all over me, the camera is completely ripped off, the lens is ripped off, a massive concussion. It was chaos. It was just chaos. Uh, there was a, a tank that, that was coming right at us, and people were running around. We heard some gunshots, and at that point we said, we're getting out of here. This is not a safe place to be, and we went to the Beijing Hotel. And at that point, I, I realized that I had to get out of there. Um, and uh, I, I tried to pedal my bicycle back to the, uh, the AP office, and it seemed like it took an eternity because there was burning buses, exploding vehicles, there was red tracers flying over the Great Hall of the People. Cindy Strand and Dave Schweisberg decided to stay in the square. This is what you're a journalist for. We're right where we need to be. We're, we're witnessing history. I mean, that's what makes a difference. If you're not there to witness, there is no record. There is no real record unless you're standing there. And that's what Dave was about. Dave was about being there and watching this moment unfold. CBS correspondent Richard Roth and his cameraman Derek Williams found a vantage point on the western edge of the square. Roth was reporting live over a large and clumsy cell phone. Now people are running away from the... Uh from the gunfire, from the advancing troops, assuming they are, they are advancing, I guess they are. We could film right into the square. We could see people on its periphery. Um, we, were, we had a good view of any action, but we were out of its, its center. There are thousands of them, and extraordinary troops in extraordinary numbers. They're moving south to north along the western side of the square. They've got, uh, they've got rifles on their shoulders, they're wearing helmets, they're in battle dress. We were immediately noticed, and a squad broke off from this column of troops and headed directly toward us. You hear that gunfire? Fire, we do hear it. Okay, we've got to get out of here. They're just, they're after Derek now, they're ripping away his camera. They're ripping away his camera and they're coming for us. An officer came up to the group and he looked at me for a second and he just threw a punch and knocked me down. The phone went spinning, I went down to the ground. We're trying to move, move back and move away. So the sequence heard by listeners was, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, which to some sounded like, oh no, oh no, oh no, a phone dropping, gunfire, and the line goes dead. The Chinese government, uh, that they wanted to stop the messengers. People like Richard Roth corresponded on the scene with the messengers. And after we received the final communication from Richard Roth, we didn't know where he was for a, a, a long time. We didn't know, we knew he'd been at least roughed up, didn't know what, how badly he'd been injured. In the uh, excitement and fear of that evening, I'd forgotten that it was a Saturday night and so that I had early deadlines. And so that hugely uh, complicated things and I ended up staying out later than I should have. And that left um, the foreign desk uh, and Cheryl really, you know, terrified that something badly had gone wrong when I didn't show up. It turned out to be really, really scary. And so, um, uh, you know, I just remember uh, calling my foreign editor and, and almost like <laughs> really um, having a fit. And he goes, calm down. He's trying to calm me down. He said, you know, just do me a favor. This is one thing that you need to start doing is keeping a tab. I said, what do you mean keeping a tab? Uh, you know, trying to track the, the number of people who do get killed. I uh, ran to Xiehe Hospital. There were uh, lots of, um, you know, uh, very bloody people in the hallways and everywhere. And w one of the ambulance drivers showed me bullet holes in his, in his ambulance. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then ran home from there. And um, so. 
very, very hurriedly filed, mm -hmm. um, you know, much later than I should have. I mean, New York um, was, uh, was really right on deadline. While all of this was happening, I was on a balcony of the Beijing Hotel uh, where I had a view down uh, into the square, and the hotel room was the only place where we could keep a phone line open uh, to Atlanta, and um, I was just uh, reporting live everything that I saw and heard. I felt kind of like a sports announcer doing play-by-play -play of this huge event. And then right in the middle of this, uh, Secretary of State James Baker appeared on CNN. He'd been scheduled, previously scheduled to be on a CNN talk show. Um, so the host uh, comes to me and says, let's go to Mike Chinoy for an update. And I talk about, I, I see bodies and bullets and chaos and mayhem. And then the host turns to Baker and says, Mr. Secretary, what's the U.S. policy on this? The troops are slowly trying to establish their control over the square. Mr. Secretary, before we move on, in light of this stronger action, does the U.S. government now take a stronger demarche against the Chinese government? Do you do something more? I do remember vividly being caught and thinking to myself, oh boy, how do I, uh, how do I answer this one? It was a hell of a story. It was breaking all over the American TV. There's no question that I was really introduced to the power of the media for the first time. Richard Roth and Derek Williams were now prisoners of the Chinese army, although soundman Dexter Leung had escaped with their video. My uh, uh, face below my eye was, was bleeding, my, my shirt was, was bloody, and uh, two soldiers carted me off and they marched uh, uh, Derek and me up uh, about a 75-yard ramp up to the Great Hall of the People. We were playing cat and mouse all night. There was a line of spectators around the square, so we would be hiding behind the spectators and we'd go in and try to film and then we'd draw back. I was on the, um, the uh, north edge, sort of between the Forbidden City okay. and the square uh, because I wanted to have a clear shot back to the Beijing right. Hotel if I had to. And, you know, there's some bushes and, right. you know, street lights and, you know, things you could sort of hide behind. I, I actually did not get into to the, the Monument of the Martyrs right. because that was just too dangerous. For many reporters, deadline pressure and filing requirements kept them away from the square at critical moments. Dan Sutherland remained in the Washington Post Bureau. My constant concern is that they will cut off communications. They don't want this to reach the outside world. I've got, I'm the bureau chief. I've got to be the guy to get everything I can get out as fast as I can get it out. But, you know, almost like working for a wire service. I just pulled up a thing that I wrote to my editors somewhere around here. To the foreign desk from Sutherland, we have two and possibly three major stories tonight. Lead all is military occupant, the main story, the lead all. Military occupation of Beijing, sporadic street fighting. There were still little battles going on. Troops moving into universities. As I speak, 30 tanks are leaving Tiananmen Square, coming down Chang'an, Dajia, in the direction of this office, firing machine guns. I will be observing them from a diplomat's apartment here. Jaime Flora Cruz stayed in the Time office. We had already closed the magazine. Uh, it was a, not, the cover was not about China, again, because the, the conventional wisdom was it's probably over. I reached a, a New York editor, reported, and he decided, you know, we're, we're going to change our, um, our cover, gave us a few hours to report, and it held, so they held the press, basically. To, um, to switch covers. I mostly sat in a studio. We had moved our whole operation into the Shangri-La Hotel. Um, I had um, uh, moved my children and uh, my wife and my dog there. And uh, mostly I just did constant stream reporting. We had open lines to New York. Uh, all you had to do was pick up a microphone and say, hello, New York, this is Beijing, and they're right there, and you're ready to go. Through the night, there was so much shooting, so many people wounded, so many people dead. In the actual square, you know, some of the students, they had their arms linked around the monument, and they were still singing. We would, you know, congregate at the, the monument because the, you know, the students still had a radio, uh, you know, uh, system set up. So they were broadcasting until the final assault, and then... You know, that was one of the first things they did was shoot out those loudspeakers that were mounted on the, 
you know, the, the, the monument to revolutionary martyrs in the center of Tiananmen Square. I thought they were going to kill them all. But as dawn approached, four intellectuals who'd been staging a hunger strike negotiated with the army to let the remaining students leave the square. I stayed in the center of the square um, with the sort of remaining students until uh, the, they had conducted their ghost, the whole crackdown happened. Um, and they conducted their negotiations with the military, which then allowed them to leave in the early morning hours, and I walked out with them. We came off the square with them. They were dejected. Some of them were still singing. And then there, there was the dilemma, well, how are we going to get back? We've got great tape. How are we going give to get it back? So this old, well, this old man in an old Mao cap and an old Mao jacket, and he was driving one of those bicycles with a flat panel at the back of it. Not a truck, but just a bicycle with a kind of a flat bed in the back. So. He let us lay on that and we took blankets and students gave us blankets and we covered everything over us. And he rode us back to the hotel. I remember Cindy hid the tapes in Dave Schweisberg's car in the parking lot of the Beijing hotel to keep them safe. And then uh, she came up to the room and, and I gave her a big hug. I was near tears. We had no idea where she or Dave had been all night. So I was incredibly relieved to see that she was okay. And then she went and she got some cheese balls from a little uh, packet and put them on a plate and gave them to me and said, happy birthday, Mike, because June 4th was my birthday. Even among normally hard-bitten journalists, the shock of the crackdown was intense. As the student loudspeakers were being torn down in Tiananmen Square, among the last things the uh, students said were Chinese people don't kill other Chinese people. They were wrong. It may strike someone as corny or sophomoric, but my, my heart wept. We saw uh, the troops open fire. Um, there was a, um, there really was a sense of betrayal and of bitterness. Dawn was, was, was just breaking and it was, uh, the light was very soft and gray and it was suffused with smoke that had come from uh, what was left of the uh, 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 protesters encampment in Tiananmen Square. We were hustled into two jeeps that were at the uh, at the bottom of the steps where where, uh, where we, we, we were being kept. There was a driver in front and an officer in the passenger seat in front. And I remember uh, he stood up and held on to a bar as we were we started driving through the square. There were workers that were uh, bulldozing rubble and sweeping up rubble. Um, but there were no bodies. There was no smell of tear gas. I don't remember seeing an ambulance, and there was certainly no sign that there had been any uh, mass killing in Tiananmen Square. But as the army moved to consolidate its control, shooting continued in other parts of Beijing. Sometimes there'd be people lying on the street. I remember one, I saw a girl who was, uh, uh, you know, in a white shirt and a navy, um, dress, uh, and her whole chest was, was red. We obviously wanted to find out how many people were killed, and one place to go was hospitals. And uh, we started checking every hospital we could find. We got into an ambulance at one point. There was a makeshift ambulance at the hospital. We rode with the ambulance for about an hour, and picked up more people, came back to the children's hospital again. And it was a pretty gruesome scene. I mean, I had been through you know, the Vietnam War and wars in Cambodia, but it was, it, was, it was pretty tough to see as much blood as we saw that night. One of the things that shook me then was there was a uh, young man, I think roughly my age, who um, had been shot in the back, was fighting for his life, and, and he, um, you know, he hadn't done anything any riskier than I had. His Luck had just run out. We were calling hospitals. Some of the hospitals we were able to get to before they were getting, uh, they were being told not to talk to outsiders. I tried to get into a hospital by pretending to be sick. Because actually I was sick to my stomach. <laughs> and uh, I said I have something wrong with my stomach, which was true. I was, <laughs> I think my stomach was in knots. Mm -hmm. And the guy behind the desk said, sir, are you really sick and who are you, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm a journalist and I, I'm here to try to find out more about what happened. And they threw me out. <laughs> it didn't take long for a controversy to erupt, which continues to this day over how many people died. One of our reporters uh, was talking to a Red Cross 
person who said, yeah, at least 500 people killed without any real verification. And we went with that store, with that number for at least a cycle, at least a day. I spoke myself to the Chinese Red Cross and they said, we have an accurate record of more than 2,000 deaths. This 2,600 or 2,700, I forget what it was, that purportedly came originally from the Chinese Red Cross, uh, that we first heard that very, very early. And it, was, it seemed to us that it was too early actually to be an authentic number. And so I was very suspicious of uh, that number, and it didn't jibe with the figures that I did have. I just believe that thousands was too much, partly just common sense. I think if it had been over 2,000, maybe we would have seen more bodies. At VOA, eventually, we settled on some sort of phrase like hundreds, if not thousands. We were never able to determine the extent of the deaths and injuries that night, all we knew is that there were tremendous numbers and the hospitals were in a panic mode. My view is whether it was a hundred or a thousand, it was you know, incredibly devastating, not only for the people involved, but for the reputation of China. After I got back to the CNN workspace uh, at the Sheraton Hotel, uh, I got a tip from a Chinese friend that the army was on the way, that there was a good chance they were going to raid the hotel, raid the workspace, uh, and seize all our tapes. And so we were really concerned about preserving uh, the record of what had happened. So I got in my car and I drove to the embassy and McKinney Russell, who was the press uh, counselor there, was, was a good friend. And he let me in and uh, when we got inside, he insisted only on writing me notes. He wouldn't speak because he, he was worried uh, that even inside the embassy that it was bugged and so we exchanged notes and I explained I thought the army was coming and was going to seize our tapes so they agreed we could keep the tapes at the embassy until things calmed down. In a day of seemingly unrelenting grimness about China there was one piece of welcome news word that our CBS News colleagues Richard Roth and Derek Williams two of the world's most experienced broadcast journalists in foreign reporting had made their way safely to a Beijing hotel. I had been injured, but uh, you know, certainly not seriously. Uh, I was hungry and dirty and tired, but otherwise okay. And um, the first person that I remember greeting me was Keith Miller, an NBC correspondent, an old friend of mine. And, uh, and he greeted me as if uh, he had been led to believe that, that I was dead. The next morning, Liu Hongxing, who'd temporarily taken over as the AP's photo editor, asked Jeff Widener to get some shots of Tiananmen Square from the Beijing Hotel. So I had to do it, and uh, I had a Levi jacket, and I hid my camera equipment inside this. Uh, I had a very long 400 millimeter lens, but it was slender, so that went into my left pocket. I had a, a doubler for the lens and went to another pocket, film in my underwear, and I had a camera body stuck in my back pocket. I finally get to the hotel and I heard rumors that other journalists had had their film and cameras confiscated. Jonathan Scher had a camera set up on the balcony of CNN's room at the Beijing Hotel. We had a camera up there trying to stay awake. We had been up for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, there was just always uh, the night before we were getting the best video we could, you could see kids coming out on stretchers. So uh, standing in front of the Beijing Hotel, I was down on the ground uh, street level, and uh, I, was, uh, I had a camera. Um, I knew that, that soldiers had gone around in trucks with speakers broadcasting that anybody who's using a camera or binoculars could be dealt with on the spot. And I asked somebody, what, what does that mean? What are they, what are they saying? They said, it means that you could be shot on the spot. We heard uh, uh, gunshots again coming from the direction of the square. And we could hear these tanks. I had a concussion and I was really spaced out. I hear the noise of tanks and I go to the window. <laughs> I remember very clearly that balcony because right above my head there was a bullet hole. So I knew that it could easily uh, pop a shot off. And I see this long column of tanks coming down the road, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, it's not a bad picture. I've got a long lens. It'll be a nice compression shot. And this guy with shopping bags walks out in front and starts waving at the bags. Another cameraman said, hey, look at that guy in front of the tank. And I looked at it and said, oh, my God, zoomed in on it and started videotaping it. And they were trying to scare him off by shooting over his head. 
while shooting over his head, was basically at, at where our position was. It was the fifth floor, the fourth floor, whatever balcony we were on, but the bullets were so close you could hear them whizzing by. And at that point, we just locked the camera down. It was just too dangerous. There were bullets ricocheting around. So I'm just like waiting for them to get shot and holding the focus on them, waiting and waiting. And it's too far away. And I just, this is too far away. It's too far away. And I look back at the bed and I had that lens doubler, which would make my 400 and 800. And I had to think, do, do I gamble? Do I go back to the bed? Maybe I lose the shot or do I just shoot this wider? So I took a chance and I ran to the bed, got it, put it on the camera, opened the aperture up all the way. One, two, three shots. People were also fleeing. They were running away, and they were, they were they were scattering from where I was standing, and they were running uh, away from the direction of the of the tanks back to where I was, where they we could they could duck down a side street. Mm -hmm. So I lifted up uh, the camera. I just took one shot, and then I ducked away also because you didn't know where the bullets were being aimed at. Some people came. They grabbed this guy, and they 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 ran off. He called me on the phone. He said, "Well." Uh, Leo, I have this, this uh, image, I think I got it, but there is this man in front of the tanks. And I said, oh, oh. I said, you know, I just instinctually fire off some advice. I said, okay, roll that f roll of film up and remove that roll from your camera and separate them in two places. And I said, leave your camera and leave your body in the hotel room and come downstairs to the lobby. I said, sometime in those early days, we have a lot of foreign students and so on. I said, just find one young man or young woman um, and see if they want to, to bring me that, that roll of film. So I took the film and I asked him if it was possible if he could take all my film and, and smuggle it in his underwear and ride the bicycle back to the AP office. So uh, another night, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes passed, an American guy with a ponytail and a backpack showed up with an AP envelope, said, is there Mr. Liu here? <laughs> and then the rest of the story, and Mikami is our Japanese Tokyo photographer, soap the film, I came out, and I look at that frame, and that's the frame, it went out. We didn't really even know what we had on the tape until we went and looked at it again. We took it back to the workspace where we had this gizmo that could send still video. It was the first, it was a, it was a prototype that Sony had given us to try out, and it would, it, would, it would scan one frame of video. It would take like an hour, hour and a half to do one frame and send it over a phone line. I think we sent five frames of it, made copies of the tape, and then we got it to the airport and gave it to a tourist to take to Hong Kong. The next morning, I pedaled back to the AP office. So I look at the clipboard, and there's these messages from all over the world. It was amazing. There were congratulations from uh, the president of AP, um, uh, congratulatory messages from bureaus all over the world. No one who has seen that is ever going to forget that picture. The man in front of the tank is unquestionably one of the great iconic images uh, of the 20th century. It's up there with the little girl being uh, hit running from a napalm strike in the Vietnam War or the sailor kissing the girl in Times Square at the end of, of World War II. It's one of those great photos and it's become a symbol of the individual standing up to the power of the state. Powerful image, uh, the, uh, but it, it does say two things. It does say also that there was a seeming reluctance on the part of the PLA to mow down people in the aftermath of that night. The fact they didn't just move right ahead and roll them over. And I don't suspect that the tank driver knew that there were like four or five cameras in the Beijing hotel trained down on this, on, on this incident. In the rush of events, Terrell Jones didn't look at his film closely and promptly forgot about it. It would be 20 years before his photo, the only one of the man in front of the tank taken at street level, was published. That same day, the dissident physicist Fong Lee Jur and his wife sought refuge at the American Embassy, 
after hiding out in a hotel room being used by Jay Matthews of the Washington Post, who'd flown in to help Dan Sutherland. U.S. diplomat Ray Burkhart handled the cloak and dagger operation. People were shooting in the streets, and it was uh, just a real sort of nightmarish atmosphere. Uh, we went and picked up, uh, picked them up in the hotel, and we brought them sort of lying on the floor of the van um, back to, to, to the embassy where he stayed for a year before he got out. Meanwhile, rumors swirled around Beijing that the military had split over the crackdown, spurred by the PLA opening fire at an apartment block housing U.S. journalists and diplomats. I was trying to get three hours sleep or whatever, and all of a sudden I hear what sounds like machine gun, automatic weapons fire hitting something near my apartment. I mean, it was very loud. Uh, staccato, you know. I just rolled out of the bed, crawled to the phone, managed to get through to Washington and said, I don't know what's going on here. It's, and I don't know what time it is. I haven't got my watch, but listen to this. I held up the phone. Part of what precipitated the embassy buildings and the uh, compound being shot up uh, was a, a CNN crew had been up there uh, the night before, the day before, uh, observing events and, and taking footage. And, and, and um, uh, some of them used my balcony, you know, and, and then the next night uh, they came, or the next day, I was actually warned by somebody in the PLA, don't be in your house after 10, your apartment after 10 a.m. And you know, I, my apartment took about 40 rounds. I mean, they just shot the place up. And I think that was to shut down CNN and the other reporting. There were these crazy rumors about, oh, well, these troops from this province and these troops from this province, they are uh, uh, really sympathetic and they're turning anti-government. It's kind of rumor that people like to believe, you know, and especially journalists, you know, it's a great story. People wanted, I think, to believe that there was conflict within the Chinese leadership, both politically and militarily, because they didn't want to have all forces and all sides of the government arrayed against the protesters. The rumors led some journalists to speculate about civil war. My biggest regret um, as a correspondent was in co-writing a piece that gave credence to the Civil War scare. I mean, we were hearing this from, um, you know, fairly senior diplomatic sources. We were hearing it from normally reliable Chinese sources. I don't think the reporting was correct, and I regret that we ran a piece that seemed to, to give credence to that. Let me think of a good military term to describe it. It was pure bullshit. And maybe the 27th and 38th Army rumors were a reflection of all of us, you know, who maybe not always really having uh, a lot that we really knew, but in a position where we kind of felt we needed to feed the beast, um, creating, um, you know, I don't think it was the finest moment of, of journalism. As an uneasy calm slowly returned to Beijing, the government issued a most wanted list. Fang Li Zhe and student leaders Wang Dan and Wu Kaixi featured prominently. Right after the crackdown, Jim Lorry had videotaped a man named Xiao Bin bitterly denouncing the government to a group of bystanders. We brought the camera in, he kept talking. At that time, there were no satellite feeds out of uh, Beijing, and we sent the tape off to Hong Kong, as we did all our tapes. All tapes went, went to Hong Kong. And the uh, tape was transmitted uh, on the Pacific Ocean satellite to California and on to New York in a raw form. Two days later, Lori turned on Chinese TV. And we see the video of him that we had shot declaring the bastards have killed thousands. I saw the tanks roll over them. And then was the super please report this man, if you know him, to local public security. And he is wanted for rumor mongering. And uh, I believe the, the, the phrase was he was a counter-revolutionary. The Chinese had intercepted the ABC satellite feed and taken the raw footage of Xiao Bin. We realized that we had just got this fellow in some pretty serious trouble. Xiao Bin was sentenced to 10 years in a labor camp. 
we were pretty devastated. Elisa Joyce and I, I think it was probably the most difficult thing as for both of us that happened in our careers as a journalist. I mean, I had covered wars, I'd been through through Vietnam, I've, I've had a lot of a lot of experiences, but to put somebody in jail, which is what we in essence did, uh, was pretty devastating. Meanwhile, the government went after the American press. In the days after the massacre, some strange things started to happen at the VOA office in Beijing. For one, we got a lot of phony phone calls. We would pick up the phone and a voice on the other end would say, is this VOA? In English, in English would say, is this VOA? And we'd say, yes. And they'd say, fuck your mother, okay? And hang up. This was pretty eerie and a little bit scary. On June 14th, Al Pesson was summoned by the police. An official who I had never seen before, and I don't know who he was, uh, read me an order which included a long diatribe against VOA's coverage of the lead up to and the massacre itself, and then ended with the phrase saying that I was expelled from China starting 72 hours from now. The same thing happened to John Pomfret. I'm interrogated about my activities uh, around Tiananmen Square and my relationship with the PLA officer uh, involving photographs, etc. And I'm like, yeah, I know him. In the end, they left. And then about three minutes later, they came back with this little blue document saying, you're both unfriendly and uncooperative. And we're giving you three days to leave China. And the state propaganda machine went into overdrive, denouncing foreign reporters for using the press shorthand of the Tiananmen Square massacre, even though there was scant evidence anyone actually died in the square itself. You could say there was a massacre around Tiananmen Square, but you couldn't say there was a massacre in the square because they were just going to shove the students out, and that's what they did. It also allowed for this sort of linguistic, uh, you know, this linguistic loophole where Chinese authorities could say, nobody died in the square. People have said to me, they say to me even now, well, well what's the difference? There were a lot of people killed that night. And I said, well, the difference is uh, place and circumstances, and the difference is truth. And um, the difference is that getting the facts right matters. No question, there is a, a real journalistic issue here. There's no question about that. But there is also uh, the broader issue. The Chinese army did kill a lot of people in Beijing uh, that night. Uh, and that's why uh, decades later, uh, the Chinese government is still extremely sensitive about any references uh, to what happened in Tiananmen Square. As my old uh, Chinese history professor uh, once said, June 4th is a date that is going to haunt authoritarian governments in China for years. As Al Pesson was packing to leave Beijing, he got a phone call at the VOA Bureau. I was sitting at my desk and the phone rang. And, and again, a Chinese man speaking English uh, saying, is this VOA? And I thought, oh, you know, not again. Are you going to give me more of these phone calls? And I said, yes, it's VOA. And he said, okay. He said, don't be discouraged. And I said, what? Excuse me? He said, don't be discouraged. And I said, okay. Uh, don't you be discouraged. And he said, okay. And we hung up. Two weeks after the crackdown, the Chinese foreign ministry invited foreign journalists to visit the square. All was quiet. A military spokesman insisted no massacre occurred anywhere in Beijing. Cindy Strand of CNN was on the tour. In her pocket, she had a lucky charm she always carried. I used to have this like a rock and I'd carry it with me. And, you know, um, they finally opened up the square and they took us on a tour. And, you know, it was funny because I used to reach into that for that rock all the time. You know, you do it without even thinking about it. And then it was broken in my pocket. And I remember thinking then, oh, the lies are just too strong.
Thank you very much, Mike, for your work in putting that uh, that very important documentary together on uh, the sad day that we will be commemorated tomorrow. Just before I uh, turn the, the mic over to, to Mike, I should mention that if you'd, any of you would like to see it, the, this documentary again or recommend it to friends, it is on the uh, US-China Institute website, USC, and it is also uh, on YouTube. In fact, uh, I guess Mike was mentioning there were 3,000 people in the last 24 hours who had looked at it on YouTube. In addition, there, if you have a computer and want to keep a copy, there are CDs uh, being sold at the table here uh, of them, and they work on both uh, uh, PC-based and Mac-based systems, although not necessarily on, on DVDs. Uh, with that, uh, Mike, do you want to say a few words, and then maybe we'll take questions? Well, why don't we just go right into, you've been sitting a long time, so I'd be interested in anybody's questions or comments. Um, I sort of feel the film says most of what I have to say about 1989. <laughs> yeah. The, the archival footage seems really lousy. Is that, the, the quality of the archival footage seems like really terrible. Is that the best that's available or you couldn't afford the good stuff? Well, the, the, it's, uh, it's 25 years ago, and not you know a lot of this stuff has been sitting in archives. Some of it also is home movies, um, since the networks charge an extortionate amount of money, which is why every penny that you pay for those DVDs will go to our you know paltry fund to buy more rights for the next. But that's that's you know a lot of it is not very good. It's, it's back to life. You and then Mike, oh, oh, he's, he's got a microphone right behind you and then oh go ahead, go ahead. Oh. I, I, hi I'm sorry it's just an observation that um, reflects to some extent on the FCC because I was here at the time uh, and also a woman I got to know through the FCC um, who the doctor Chinese doctor who was the subject of and wrote the book love is a many splendid thing uh -huh. That was Han Su Yin, so she was connected with this place. And through that, through that movie, I knew her. When she came down from China, she had actually undergone a political transformation. And she'd become from being a Western sort of uh, uh, conservative, had become a communist, very much so. And she was up in China, and when she came down here, I asked her if she'd do a television interview with me. And she said, sure, because I knew her through, through the FCC. And I asked her the question uh, that everybody's asked ever since. Um, is it true that people were not killed in, in, uh, in uh, Tiananmen Square? She said, I will tell you categorically, this is on television here, I should tell you, categorically, nobody was killed in Tiananmen Square. Now, I've asked the question dozens of times since, and people have said, oh, some say there were, some say there weren't. Um, there is no doubt about it, a lot of people were killed around and about Tiananmen Square, and that's not really surprising in a way, because I understood there were several, quite a number of PLS soldiers who were hanged by revolutionaries in Tiananmen, who were operating around Tiananmen Square. But the fact is, I've asked this question so many times, and I've never got a definitive answer to the question, were people actually killed in Tiananmen Square? Never got an answer. Well, I think the closest answer you're going to get is what's in the film. There isn't a 100% categorical definitive answer because nobody has the 100% categorical um, in, you know, information. And it's all putting pieces together of a kind of giant jigsaw puzzle. Most of the evidence from most of the eyewitnesses are that it, if, if you define the square as the, you know, going from the Chang'an Street at the top below the Mao portrait, down the Museum of History on one side and the Great Hall of the People on the other side, past the Mao Mausoleum, down to the bottom there, that in that square uh, there's very little credible evidence that I've seen, and all the folks in the film say that, that in that space that people were killed. And it is interesting that the military 
agreed to negotiate to allow the remaining protesters gathered around the monument to walk out. So they were clearly not under instructions to mow them all down. Um, so, and, and I think this press shorthand of the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which is just one of these, you know, things that gains currency, um, <coughs> sort of accentuated this, this issue and gave the Chinese government a peg to say, see, the foreign media got it all wrong, they all talk about the Tiananmen Square Massacre when there wasn't a Tiananmen Square Massacre. But plenty of people were killed. I mean, I saw people killed in front of my own eyes. I was standing on a balcony of the Beijing Hotel. It's about 400 yards from the square. People were killed on the western approaches on Chang'an Street. Plenty of people were killed. But in that square space, I've not seen much evidence to suggest people were killed. But the story we're getting here, and, and uh, re reported in several media, was that the tanks were running over students in their tents in the square, and, uh, and actually just massive. Well, there, there were there were there were amazing. You know, you have to picture the scene at the time. Incredible fear, no credible information, huge numbers of rumors, everything second hand, third hand. A lot of deaths, a lot of injuries. You know, there were rumors tanks were running over students in their tents. There were rumors of thousands of people killed. There were rumors that soldiers were hopped up on drugs. I mean, it's very hard to know. But, you know, there are interviews with several people who were in the center of the square till the bitter end who didn't see it. Sorry, you had? Yeah, Mike, the question I wanted to ask was, at the time, how did you and your colleagues or to what degree you thought you and your colleagues uh, felt that the Chinese leadership knew what was really going on. So how close or how detached were they from what you were experiencing actually in the square itself? And up until the point that they sent in the troops, how well do you think they were handling it? Well, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know. Um, I mean, it was all happening essentially right outside where their offices were. There's, I'm sure there were no shortage of, you know, officials and intelligence agents and others feeding back information. Um, they were, and the other thing was the leadership was divided. I mean, that's, that's one of the, you know, very, very important factors that, that contributed to the way this played out. You had Zhao Ziyang and people around Zhao Ziyang who were essentially sympathetic to the students who wanted, who, who sort of agreed with them on a lot of the substantive issues and wanted to have a faster pace of reform, wanted to introduce political reforms. Um, and I think to some degree sought to kind of manipulate the students to sort of say, look, you know, they're on our side, this strengthens our position. And then you had uh, people like Premier Li Peng and Deng Xiaoping and some of the other party elders who saw this, I would say, on a couple of levels. One was um, that through the, really somebody like Deng, who'd been purged twice and, and was sent down for years during the Cultural Revolution, he looks out the window of Zhongnan High and sees the Cultural Revolution all over again and chaos and young people rampaging through the streets and, you know, stability in jeopardy, and I think they saw this as a very dangerous threat to the Communist Party's hold on power, and so they, they felt that they, they had no choice. And that power, that fight went on, and, and it wasn't until it was resolved in the favor of the hardliners that they really acted. And so, um, and then they made a decision, but, but, but even then I think they were you know, they were not sure what to do or how to do it, and there's evidence, there, there's certainly, there, the Civil War thing was completely wrong, but there was certainly evidence that there were disagreements, and at least some in the military were, were not comfortable with the idea of moving in, and, and they didn't have any experience with this kind of thing. Um, so it took them a while to sort of figure it out, and then they finally said, all right, enough is enough, and then, and then they moved. Else? Hello, Mike. Thank Hi. you so much for the documentary. Um, can you hear? Hello? Hi. 
Um, I have a question on the accountability of journalism. On the on the accountability the, of yeah. journalism. Mm -hmm. um, before today, I've seen the photo of the man before the tanks, and I literally thought he was crushed alive. And also by the articulation Tiananmen massacre, I've been wondering until today, gosh, how many people got killed? When the Japanese killed 300,000 people in Nanking, we call it a massacre. When the Brits slaughtered Irish, we call it a massacre. But from what's been told in the film today, it, it became evident to me that the tanks, unlike what I thought, which was moving in to just literally wipe out everybody, they were there to just scare the students away. So it wasn't, so, but the popular beliefs about the, the incidents was that the Chinese government um, cracked down ruthlessly, killing people. And for something that's so important to, as you said, the history of media, also to how, how the rest of the world related to China, do you not think the subsequent, this, this letting popular inaccurate beliefs gain currency, see, while ha not having you and all these people watch what happened, really know what's happened, standing up to say, look, um, we are as powerful in, as telling the truth, as in perhaps misleading people. Do you not think there's this issue with accountability of journalism? Power should be used with discretion um, to check the government, but also to present a fair picture. Do, I think, do you think this journalist, all these journalists who are in the position to say what's really going on have failed in a way? Well, I, 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 when you talk about Western journalists, I think I would I'm say just saying journalism in general right, because okay. I was actually wondering why there were no Chinese journalists like well, in the no, film. Because it would be impossible to talk to any Chinese journalist. They wouldn't be given permission. They'd be too afraid. Uh, any, anyone in China would not be in a position to, to say anything. And the film is about American journalists because I work for something called the U.S. China Institute and our mandate is to explore issues in the U.S. China relationship. I would say the vast majority of the journalists on the ground in Beijing made a serious good faith effort and uh, you know you have to have lived through it to really imagine the degree of chaos of uncertainty uh, combined with the pressures of deadlines round the clock reporting um, you know you can argue over how many how many bodies, you know, people talk about the Columbine massacre in Colorado when the guy went into the high school and he killed what, 20 people or something like that. Or, so there's no question at least several hundreds of people died. They were, the vast majority were killed by the PLA on their way to take control of Tiananmen from the protesters. So I think the idea that that, you know, I don't have a problem with people who describe that as a massacre or large-scale killing. I think the, the, the notion of the, the, the this shorthand of the Tiananmen Square massacre, it sort of took on a meaning beyond the specifics. And it's, I, I, I mean, I'm sure I used, I, I may have used it at the time somewhat, but I very quickly called it the Tiananmen Square crackdown because that seemed to me to be fair and get away from the idea of Tiananmen Square Massacre. And also, Richard, Richard Roth is right. Getting the facts right matters. But there was a lot of killing, and the vast majority of it was the responsibility of the PLA, although there's no question that some protesters also killed some troops. But I think people were trying to do their jobs. You know, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. Your deadline is 5 o'clock. You've been in the square. You've watched bodies. You've seen bullets. It's, you know, you're totally exhausted. you got to file. I'm live on the phone, looking out the window. Um, I think, you know, in the aftermath, there were a number of very serious attempts by people to go back and look at it. But, you know, it's it's like something going viral on the web now. These things do take on a life of their own. I just saw a headline today in, in a British newspaper about, you know, amnesia over the Tiananmen Square massacre. 
Um, all I can say is I tried very hard not to do that, but not everybody did. But I think most of the journalists did make serious good faith effort under, as I hope this conveyed, exceptionally challenging conditions to make sense of this, and scary conditions. I'm sorry. Uh, I just I have two questions, one very broad one, one very specific one. Uh, your focus is on American journalists, and as, as it should be. Uh, can you give any insight, you know, there were Hong Kong journalists, Japanese journalists, European journalists also there, uh, filing maybe differently nuanced reports or not? I mean, I, what's your opinion on that? Second question is, Chai Ling was one of the darlings of the American press at that time. You choose not to mention that. Uh, in the in the in, in the film, uh, she's known for uh, litigious behavior uh, when uh, she's quoted or misquoted or, or is is that is that part of the reason why you didn't use? No, her? it had nothing to do, nothing. I mean, there are a lot of people and a lot of journalists and a lot of other actors who aren't in this film, and it's just one of these things you you can't cover every base all the time. It's just as simple as that. Um, and I think, by and large, the, the, the coverage of Hong Kong and Japanese and European could be broadly similar. I mean, maybe slightly different sort of perception of the idea of democracy since the US saw itself as you know, the center of democracy. But you, you pick up a, a headline on June 4th or June 5th uh, from any major newspaper in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Seoul, Bangkok, uh, London, Paris, Brussels, Sao Paulo, and it will be Chinese troops crush pro-democracy demonstrators. I don't think it'd be that much different. Yes. So as I'm sure that's happened every year since you have experienced this, do you foresee this year, next year, five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line, are we ever gonna get any sort of more official response? Do you feel that there's going to be anything else shed upon this event in history from any source? Well, as Joe N. Lai famously said when somebody asked him what his opinion was about the French Revolution, he said, it's too early to tell. Um, I don't know, and I long ago learned that trying to predict China is a, a, a good way to make yourself look like an idiot, and at least now that I'm not working for CNN, I embarrass myself in front of small audiences instead of large ones on watching TV all over the world. I don't really know. I mean, it would, it would, it, it's hard to say. I mean, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, the, 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 degree of, the degree to which it's a sensitive issue is reflected in the way the authorities uh, respond to it. Um, it would take a very significant political change in China. Um, on the other hand, with the passage of time, most of the major players are gone from the scene. It's interesting that Hu Yaobang's son went to Japan some weeks ago. Um, it's interesting, there are rumors that the anti-corruption campaign may be targeting Li Peng and his family. So there may be some sort of indirect ways to whittle away at some portions of it. But it's hard for me to see the, the, the Chinese Communist Party in the direction it's going now, you know, doing a kind of reversal of the verdict. Um, and, and, you know, with the passage of time, even though it's a kind of, you know, un, unhealed sore, there are enough other things. So I'd be surprised, but, you know, if somebody had sat me down 30 years ago and said, let me sketch out a scenario for China, which includes Tiananmen, the greatest economic, economic boom in the history of the world, et cetera, et cetera, I would have said, you know, what drug are you taking? So it's, who knows? Let's take a couple more questions. Yes. Um, we saw a shot of the famous picture of the man in front of a tank. Um, the film alluded to the fact that he wasn't killed, he survived. I just wondered what happened next. Like, did he step aside or did the tanks go around well, him? It's one of the, the, great, the great mysteries. There are any, there, there are, there were, there were reports that claimed to name him. There are reports that claimed that he was tracked down and executed. We don't know. Um, is the honest answer. We don't know for sure. Barbara Walters um, uh, interviewed Jiang Zemin in 1991 for MB ABC or NBC, and I interviewed her for the series. And in the next episode, I'm going to 
talk about this. It's a great. She pulls the picture of the man in front of the tank out, hands it to Zhang Zemin, and says, "What happened to this guy?" And he just dodged the question. So we don't we don't really know. But um, you know, it was true at the time. And in fact, back to your question, um, the film, which was shown at length all over the world at the time. And the, the sequence ends with two or three of these guys' buddies coming out and pulling away, and they run down a side street. So it would, nobody ever claimed, no serious journalist who was there ever claimed that the tank ran over the guy. It just may be that people see this photograph and assume that the next step is, but in fact, it didn't happen, and it was never claimed that it was, and the video that was out there then and is still out there makes that absolutely clear that so that no nobody's ever asserted that the tank ran over the, the guy who stood in front of it. One more maybe? Yes. Um, I I was quite amazed that, you know, um, in the heat of all these and you guys were still being able to so station in the Beijing hotel and knowing that actually the Chinese government obviously don't like you guys. And uh, so how did you feel at that time can you tell us what exactly the control and the sort of, um, you know, the, the freedom that you, you guys can have in reporting in, in Beijing? And also sort of compared to nowadays, 25 years later, do you feel that there is a difference in the sort of control of the government over the foreign journalists? Well, there, there are two sort of, they're related but different questions. I mean, one of the enduring mysteries to me is why after martial law, the government didn't move much more forcefully to sort of get the foreign press under control. And I think the answer is they were so preoccupied with the internal situation that once they sort of pulled the satellite, ordered the live satellite transmission stop, they just were so, they just couldn't be bothered. And also, there was a period of about 10 days after martial law was declared when essentially the, the, um, you know, the, the police were off the streets, there, were, there was, if not anarchy, there was, you know, the normal sort of law, you know, it was martial law, but the troops were on the outskirts, the rest of Beijing, there were roadblocks and barricades and no authority, um, but it was amazing to us. And then again, on the night, I think they were so preoccupied with getting control of the square and getting control of the streets that they just, I mean, I was amazed that they didn't just send a squad of troops into the Beijing hotel, go room to room, cut the phone lines. People thought they were going to do that. I mean, Dan Sutherland in the Washington Post went back to his bureau for the night because he wanted to keep the phone line open. I was dying to get out in the square with Cindy, my camera woman, but I knew that I didn't have a cell phone that worked properly, and I knew that if I couldn't be on the air live every minute, if I didn't have an open phone line. So I had to stay and sort of watch a couple hundred yards um, down. And, you know, they were not very efficient at that. Maybe it was just lack of experience, but, um, you know, some people bringing tapes back to the Beijing Hotel had them seized. Others were able to slip by. Um, where's Martin, who was, uh, yeah, who worked as a sort of helper for the CNN? I haven't seen you since then. Um, and you were just talking about how we sneaked out of the Beijing Hotel with, I think, tapes and quit, uh, you know, hidden in a bag early in the morning on June 4th and ran around the corner just as the army opened fire and shot all these people and we got in this little rickshaw and we got away with our tapes out to the Great Wall Sheraton where we made dubs of them and then somebody took them out to the airport and handed them to tourists and they got out to Hong Kong. And, and it, took a couple, it took them a few days to just get their act together. And I think one of the differences now is that in a crisis situation like this, or in a situation of high anxiety, they're much more effective at being able to sort of stop things in their tracks before they get going. And I mean, one of your colleagues had a piece the other day, I think, saying that reporters had been called in and warned not to go to Tiananmen Square. So, you know, in that sense, they're much more efficient and much more sophisticated, and they can use all the tools. Um, but that's just in relation to like the Tiananmen anniversary. I still think that you're getting some amazing, brilliant reporting on China in spite of these restrictions because the flip side of that is it's much easier to travel now. 
uh, in theory, journalists can talk to anybody who are, any people who are willing to talk to them. The general controls in the society are looser. It's much more open. There's the internet. There's Weibo. So you know, it's this odd sort of paradox where on the one hand you have a government that uses all these tools to sort of, particularly on sensitive anniversaries like Can Amen, um, to make sure that nothing gets out that they don't want to get out. On the other hand, because of the way the country has developed and because of the changes in a positive direction in terms of conditions for reporters, with a lot of anxiety and stress, you can do a lot more and learn a lot more and go to a whole lot more places than it was possible when, when I was there at that time. So it's a kind of interesting mixed paradox. Okay, one last question and then... Yes. Sorry, it's not really a question. It's just that I was amazed by uh, how the split-second decisions that some of you had to make, like Jeff with the man in the tank, to uh, grab somebody, uh, a passerby, and trust them and say, "Stick that in your underwear and take." It. And you know, thanks to mm -hmm. those those unrecognised people yeah. as well. You know, if they or the decisions that you made as to who you grabbed and who yeah. you trusted. Uh, yeah. that well, was... well one, I mean, one of the things I think a lot of people sort of don't understand about, about journalism, when you, when you watch it on TV or when you open the newspaper or go to the website, it all looks so authoritative and so polished. And the old joke is the two things you don't want to see the inside of are a sausage factory and a newsroom, and for the same reason. The process is incredibly messy and, you know, the, 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 just that, that's a good example of how, um, I mean, I, the night before June 4th, I was, um, I was sound asleep. Um, and it wasn't, it was somebody else uh, came and, and called me up and I pick up the phone and it's this like Hungarian student. He says, Mike, shit is coming down. And, you know, I had to go back immediately to just fall asleep back to the square. But all these little sort of moments and accidents and just happened to be, in the right place at the right time. Um, uh, it's what makes it remarkable that it came out the way it did because when you're in the middle of it, it's much more fraught and uncertain and you have no idea if any of it's going to work or it's going to get through or you're going to get... And I think with the benefit of hindsight, I think you can make lots of criticisms of a lot of the specifics. But I think the totality of the coverage, given the nature of the circumstances that people were operating in, stands up with some egregious errors, like on the brink of civil war, by and large pretty well. And I, th I think it's, it's an amazing credit to the people who were sort of doing this, you know, operating on no sleep week after, and you know, just adrenaline and whatever, week after week after week in this incredibly bewildering, fast moving thing. You couldn't call anybody to get a clarification about anything. With that, Thank you very much, Mike. First, let's give a hand of applause for Mike. We're a little out of order in these documentaries. We're looking forward to having you come back at the end of August or in September to show the mid-1980s, I believe it is, for no, foreign correspondents. we're going to show the 1970s. We're all the way back to mid-1970s. Okay, yeah, we going, missed one in there. Yeah. Um, and uh, as we always do, although I think you, by now you have a full collection, we like to give you something to remember the club by. So, my you probably have the red one and the blue one oh, by, uh, by now. Great tie uh, collection here. Thank one. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.